Well, I think we should go ahead and get started. Great. I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of our entire team here at the Arizona Telemedicine Program and Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. My name is Janet Major and I'm the Associate Director for Innovation and Digital Health. And I'm looking forward to today's presentation with our guest, Carol Yarborough. Uh, the title of the program will be Takeaways from the AHLA Institute on Medicare and Medicaid Payment Issues. I'd also like to begin before we get started by reading this beautiful land acknowledgement on behalf of the University of Arizona. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the O'odham and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign Native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. Since 2011, our Southwest Telehealth Resource Center and Arizona's Telemedicine Program have partnered with various healthcare organizations to bring you over 200 informative webinars. And these are all archived for the gift that keeps giving. So if you like what you saw, please, please keep in touch and, and be sure to share with your friends the archive from today if they do want an update, uh, because this is going to be great information. As you joined our webinar today, your microphone was muted and please use the chat function to ask questions. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. We do have people here from all over the United States, and we specifically want to welcome the folks from the region that we serve, as well as our fellow HRSA grantees. We welcome you. Yay. Telemedicine can help you achieve goals of, of being more efficient, improving quality, safety, and access to care, and we're here to, to promote that idea and to share information. Once again, I have the pleasure of introducing our friend and colleague, Carol Yarbrough. This is probably your seventh webinar she's done on billing, something that changes in an ever-changing world. She's got some really exciting news for us today. And I would like to say that she's absolutely the rock star in, the, in, this, in this field, in this space. Uh, not only is she uh, a, an expert in healthcare compliance and, and reimbursement, but I gotta tell you, she's a dog lover. She plays the French horn. She's the real deal. She's the whole package. And we're so lucky because she makes this very dry subject really interesting and fun, if you can believe it. She's a healthcare compliance and reimbursement specialist providing a unique background in legal technology, revenue management, clinic management with both federal and state regulations. <clears throat> And she is actively a contributor to telehealth in initiatives at UC Health. She works hands-on with professional fee and hospital-based fee professionals to implement billing strategies. And she provides real-time feedback to cl clinicians regarding documentation and their staff with encounter guidance. She trains CPT coding professionals at UC Medical Center to maximize EMR workflow with greater documentation and coding. So I really am excited to have you here again today, Carol. We are so lucky that we know you, that we know people, but especially that we know you and, uh, and that you're so happy to share your expertise. So welcome and take it away, Carol. Well, I am just, I'm not going to measure up to that glowing introduction, but thank you so much. Um, to the Arizona Telemedicine Program and the TRC to uh, welcome me again to speak to you. I'm just so grateful that you're here to spend your time to listen to me. Uh, kind of, I, I was saying to, with a friend of mine at a at our last webinar or conference that we try to do kind of like the comedy driver training school for people that get tickets, but translate that over to CPT coding and reimbursement issues. So, um, and you know, again, these are very serious times and, you know, I try not to make light, of course, of what's going on, but, um, you know, a little bit of humor does mask the sadness. So here we go. Oh, and yeah, there's my picture of when, you know, pan before the pandemic started, um, gotten a little hairier. So these are my opinions. I, I may have gotten a few things wrong from the takeaways from the American Health Lawyers Association uh, conference, which I attended in Baltimore uh, in, in mid-March. Seems so long ago now. I think it was just a week and a half ago. Um, 
And again, the organization sponsoring my appearance before you today, uh, they don't guarantee any of the accuracy or reliability of my information, but um, I do. And I don't have the regular disclaimer slide up, but my dogs are here innocently sleeping, persuading me that they're not going to bark during the webinar. I could have gone into an office today, but I thought I, I love running that, that gamut. Okay, so the objectives are kind of like really my observations of what happened during the AHLA conference. This is the first conference a lot of people had been to in over two years. And it was a hodgepodge of information. I had never attended the American Health Lawyer Association conference on Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement payment issues. And everybody was super happy to be out of the living room and into a conference room. Um, I, I was a little leery about going into the reception room afterwards because uh, I, I was just keeping my mask on. I, I don't know. It's hard for me to even leave the house still. But um, the following slides are definitely are snips from sessions I attended. And I do thank the providers of those, uh, those PowerPoint presentations and information they provided in advance. I, I borrowed shamelessly from their slide decks, just shameless. So here are some stats, um, just some stats that were presented at the very beginning of the conference. So CMS, you know, recently there are articles that are coming out that are sort of mixing in stats from commercial payers, stats from Medicaid, stats. And the percentages just don't seem that high in comparison of like how telehealth grew and how important it was to CMS beneficiaries. I uh, recently read an article that said, you know, telehealth was really just relegated to 10% of the, uh, the health, health seeking population, health services seeking population. But, um, as you can see from this CMS data grab uh, from a website that I have the URL at the, on the end of the slide, and don't worry, uh, you're going to get the slides. Um, you know, as of September 9th, there were 28 million point two, 28 point two million unique telemedicine users, which is over half of the Medicare beneficiary population. So people had at least once, one, at least one telemedicine interaction. Now, whether or not that was an e-visit, a virtual, well, those aren't telemedicine, are they? This was actual uh, telehealth or audio visit data. So in the rural areas, uh, we reached 44% of the population and urban areas, 55% of those numbers came from urban. So, you know, when we continue to talk about broadband and um, accessibility, these numbers do show that the progress still needs to be made. Um, even in areas where broadband is available, this also sort of shows, in my mind, that uh, that people in urban areas really need telehealth too. I, during, during the pandemic here uh, where I live in San Francisco, the buses really never, well, they didn't run. So unless you took a lift or drove, there was no way to get to a actual physical provider appointment. So it was very convenient and easy to go ahead and take take a uh, take liberty take a, what am i trying to say i'm tongue-tied today just because janet was saying like i i'm so funny uh to take uh, advantage of the telehealth modality uh, which made it very easy to continue getting health care and of course due to the fact that i was also very privileged to have great wi-fi 
um, multiple devices in the household, et cetera. Uh, we did despair of, you know, the, um, the ability, our, our download speeds often would slow down after 10 a.m. when all the teenagers in the neighborhood would get up and put on, you know, uh, gaming computers or Netflix. And realizing this is a very privileged uh, sort of lament to have. So there is a lot of work to be done in terms of broadband. And I, slides like this do show that. And then another interesting thing, um, you know, here's the pre-pandemic and pandemic period. You know, it went from a million users to 28 million. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. But not really, because you know what? It wasn't paid for. It wasn't reimbursed unless you were in a HRSA geographic area. Um, interestingly, uh, e-visits and virtual check-ins are not considered telehealth. And you can see they didn't grow quite as exponentially in the e-visit realm, but virtual check-ins did. Because that could have be audio, audio video. Um, and it had to have been synchronous or asynchronous uh, if it was going to be a G2, G2012 for synchronous audio or visual or both. Um, and for the asynchronous, that was usually for instances of, you know, submitting things for dermatological uh, instances where asynchronous was not quite recognized. Um, E-visits took a little bit longer to socialize amidst everyone that would think, well, you know, providers, administrators thinking, I can't start charging patients for EMR messages, but I really do need to, to tell them that they need to continue taking their medication when they email me certain questions. Well, that's what an e-visit is. It's an asynchronous type of encounter where you can uh, address a medical issue, but asynchronous. You know, it's not texting, it's through a secure network. And it did not grow quite as exponentially. I'd, I'd be interesting to see, I'd be interested to see what those figures look like uh, for February 28th, 2022. Um, so here, the, you know, the data is very convincing. E-visit users grew as of April 2020. People tried it out, kind of leveled off. Virtual check-ins was crazy high compared to that. But, you know, picking up a phone is a little bit easier than figuring out how to bill an e-check-in, which has certain time parameters around it. So uh, as, it, as does a virtual check-in. But... Um, there you go. I, this data is really cool. Uh, again, the link is on the, the slide deck and you can take a look at that. So I, that was one of the takeaways I thought was really great. Just seeing that data, realizing it was there on the ASPE website, available to anybody to review, to contemplate, to convince your stakeholders at your institutions or in your clinics that you know, look, everyone else is doing this. <laughs> or, um, you know, what kind of sustainability can we build into our system should the public health emergency waivers not be extended through our following the Consolidated Appropriations Act flexibilities? And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the next topic I, I, I thought was amazing was reassignment. I know it's hard to get excited about credentialing and assigning billing privileges to clinics and Medicare administrative contractors, but I was really excited. Um, I had found information about this, much to my surprise, I had forgotten that I had found it in November of 2021 um, concerning whether or not a provider in normal times should be licensed in the state where they are located as well as in the state where the patient is located when providing telehealth services. And just understanding the mechanics 
of how to do this eluded me and many of my colleagues for about five or six years. And then we came across this uh, fabulous updated snippet from the internet or the you know the online manual that CMS publishes. Um, Interjurisdictional reassignments. Okay, few few definitions. The reassigner. So it's kind of like it's like backwards. So you've got an employee and an employer. So the employer you think is the person doling out the money or the the or type of word <laughs> in this in this in, in this instance the reassigner is the provider and the reassignee is the healthcare facility so uh i know it's confusing but this is going to help a lot of people especially in arizona where there are people reassigning and i've got a i've got a, a the next slide on uh, reassigning their rights to the reassignee in Arizona from other states, because you do have a lot of uh, rural areas in Arizona that need behavioral health providers, primary care providers, uh, not available in rural or even urban areas at a moment's notice. So. Reassigner, okay, I'm gonna read this because it looks goofy, pursuant to the reassignment. I don't need to enroll in the reassignee's contractor jurisdiction to practice in the reassignee state, nor be licensed. But, you know, it's, it's just kind of obvious, but if I'm going to be performing services and billing for them, I have to. So it's not like, you know, you have to be enrolled with everyone everywhere, just as a, as a state of being as a provider or a reassigner. But if you want to do services somewhere else, you have to. Okay. So in plain language, yeah, this is this is how I feel about it when I see my new residents, when I see a new resident in primary care. Okay, Dr. Whitecoat, aka Doogie, is the reassigner. He lives in Arizona and he's enrolled with jurisdiction jurisdiction F Part B, Neridian, your Medicare administrative contractor in Arizona. He wants to provide telehealth service for the Jones Clinic in California. I've loosely uh, uh, paraphrased the example that's in the, the online manual. Dr. Whitecoat then obtained his license in California. California does not have a quick license. It is not like Arizona that says, here, just fill out this form and we're going to take your license and adopt it. You got to get your full medical license there, go through the whole shebang. Then he reassigned his enrollment to the reassignee, Jones Clinic, located in California, which is jurisdiction E, not F, Part B, also Neridian. Same Medicare administrative contractor, but it's a different jurisdiction. So in the practice location information of the form CMS 855B, Jones Clinic, who's doing all the work, which they should after Dr. Whitecoat just got his license, paid all the fees, filled out all the forms, waited around for a while. Um, the Jones Clinic is going to select the practice location type as other healthcare facility and specify telemedicine location. Then Dr. Whitecoat's address is listed on the 855B. But the practice location that shows up on the CMS 1500 is the Jones Clinic. Now, when this first came out from CMS, we didn't have that citation, which was strange because that was 2016. And I think we started grumbling about it around, 
oh, maybe it was 2015 or 2016. Um, we did get a letter from CMS that said, you know, do this X, Y, Z. So when you're filling out that form, the reason why you have to specify the telemedicine location of Dr. Whitecoat's home address is because we're gonna follow the gypsy calculation for reimbursement with jurisdiction F for Neridian because they pay a little bit less in Arizona for services for Medicare beneficiaries than in, for instance, San Francisco, California. Housing prices are probably triple. <laughs> Malpractice insurance is higher. It costs more to do business here. Ergo, the, gyp the geographic practice, I've got that acronym, the gypsy, is higher in California than Arizona. So they wanna make sure they're paying the provider through the Jones Clinic in California, the proper reimbursement of where they are located. Used to be in chapter 15. If you go to chapter 15 now, it says everything's been moved to chapter 10. <laughs> it's just okay. And there's a few changes in semantics and then the special call out to additional form 855R. See, it's just not, it's not the same title. It says interjurisdictional reassignments. This one says additional form A55R policies and processing alternatives, interjurisdictional reassignments. So there's a little bit more meat to it. it it's pretty much the same. It, it, it tends to read just a little bit easier to me. That blew my mind. I know, easily amused, easily mind blown, but I got very excited when I saw that citation during the conference and emailed it, emailed it to a bunch of uh, colleagues who were also similar, similarly excited. Okay, so the license part. The license part is tripping a lot of people up right now. Like, what do I do if the PHE is over? And... Um, well, you're going to do what you did during the PHE. You're going to see if the state in which you want to practice medicine is accepting out-of-state licenses. Uh, the Fed, uh, this is the Federation of State Medical Boards website. It's just updated. What's today's date? 13th, 14 days ago. Um, it calls out wonderfully about which states are allowing new applications for out-of-state licensing, states that continue to have waivers for out-of-state licenses, that USVI is US Virgin Islands, states without waivers, there's 30 states, there's not a whole lot left anymore, uh, DC and Guam, states allowing out-of-state physicians long-term or permanent would be uh, only seven, plus D DC, plus CNMI, blanking, and Puerto Rico. So don't forget about our territories, also covered by Medicare, as Medicare beneficiaries do live in the uh, US territories as well. Um, it is what it is, and, you know, uh, so what's in effect in Arizona? So the status, when you go onto that FSMB website, it says active for those already with emergency temp licenses, which were granted through December 31st. Uh, Arizona also has license reciprocity. They will recognize out-of-state occupational licenses who have been licensed in their profession for at least one year good standing and you're gonna pay a fee and you're gonna do some background track, background checks. And um, this is a live link that'll take you to what that means. Um, understanding Arizona's universal occupational licensing recognition bill. 
so you know very progressive and accepting um it's a it's a wonderful it's a it's a great it's a great thing for arizona so again mind blown um licensing there we go okay so the office of inspector general and compliance considerations um i'd say the the biggest thing that i learned at AHLA is that we all need to be reminded that even with all the waivers and the promises that we would not be audited during the scrambling of the public health emergency, there are audits going on and there will be audits going on. Um, but the interesting thing is what they're calling telehealth, really telehealth, they, the Office of Inspector General, so again, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Licensor issues. People were confused about how to practice telehealth before COVID. And that persisted and continues to persist throughout the public health emergency because the states are constantly changing whether or not they still have waivers, uh, the extent of the waivers, um, because the CMS waiver of licensure is different about the state position on licensure. CMS says it doesn't matter where you're licensed, you can practice everywhere. The states are like, not so fast, feds. We have, we have differing opinions on that. So even though CMS said it doesn't matter, go forth and practice medicine wherever, states are like yeah but you know you got to pay some fees and you know now that we're getting used to this constant state of emergency which is very tiring uh you know we're going to start putting up some some guidelines and some practice uh practice guidance that needs to be met so um the changes are ongoing. As you can see, the FSMB uh, little snippet I put there was updated on March 31st. Uh, as the waivers expand, contract, <laughs> ingress, egress, as the moon wanes and waxes, those change. Um, so not only do you find those state changes on the Federation website, but you can also find those changes on the Center for Connected Health Policy website as well. And, you know, between the two, you're going to get a pretty, you're going to get a great sense of, you know, what is applicable during a specific time period. And if, and if the website seems incorrect on either, um, you'll get a really fast response from CCHP on that. So everybody can now just email over to CCHP and tell them Carol sent you. Just kidding. Um, so anyway, whether or not you had a temporary or emergency license, like Arizona granted emergency licenses, which are in effect through the end of this year. Um, so as of as of the the time when this slide was put together, and then when I, I lifted it yesterday, last night, um, as of January, you can see there's a few differences between the January stats and the stats on that FSMB website. So again, in two months, three months, things change. Uh, I still don't know what CNMI means. Maybe someone just told me in the chat. Hmm. Dum -da -dum. Oh, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Lisa Roach said, what can you do if a commercial carrier will only cover telehealth if the provider and patient are physically located in the same state? Well, you can provide them with CMS's guidance in your appeal letter or in your, in, during your contracting discussions and say, this is what the Fed said, and this is what the two states, the state where the provider is located and the state where the patients are located, 
Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Look, everyone just raced to the Google or they knew it off the top of their heads. I think, well, this is a smart group. You knew it. Thank you. Okay, back to Lisa. Um, commercial payers can do what they want. Um, but if you can catch them out and say, this is what the feds say, and this is what the state says, and shouldn't you have some kind of alignment with the state medical board in which you are practicing your coverage? Um, I don't know. Take them to task. I'll help you. My eyes twitching when I said that, but I'll help you, Lisa. Oh, maybe someone's been to the Mariana Islands. That would be nice. Okay. So um, what's going to happen after the, the PHE is over? It's been extended, by the way. I've got a slide on that in the very end because it was published this morning. The PHE was extended past Saturday and is now extended throughout until July 15th, by the way. Um, CMS could ad adopt its licensure requirement changes it waived. Great. Doesn't mean anything about the states. <laughs> um, right. Doesn't, doesn't impact state licensure requirements. What are the enforcement hotspots? Now, anyone with a dog, you're thinking, oh my God, they just got a flea bite. Um, so the OIG focused on telehealth and telehealth fraud with the broad expansion, but you know, the telehealth fraud we've seen, okay, they submitted 4.5 billion in false or fraudulent telehealth claims. I have to say, I believe in our institutions and our medical providers and these bad actors are the usual bad actors. Pharmaceuticals, DME, and then the over-prescribing or over-requesting of diagnostic genetic testing. Um, happens on the ground. It happens on the internet. It's the same thing. It's just been taken a step further. Um, it's not real. <laughs> doesn't really have anything to do with the provision of an evaluation and management visit, which is what we think of when we think of telehealth. Well, it's what I think of. So, um, OCR is going to continue the enforcement discretion related to the form and format tools. Um, I've read some things where, you know, phones and video phones, smartphones will continue to be in use. The programs that will be allowed may be pared down a bit. WhatsApp, stuff like that. So, what we have is pre-COVID. This is a nice, I think this is from the HCCA magazine. I recall seeing this in compliance today. Um, this is from uh, Marty Arvin's deck. So the providers that are eligi eligible to bill pre-COVID during COVID. So we went from that, that usual list but now we get to add the PTs, OTs, SLTs. And I'm, I'm always sad when I don't see respiratory therapists unless they're including that under occupational and physical. Because COVID at the outset was primarily a respiratory, uh, respiratory disease. So... I don't know why they don't put respiratory therapists on there because people ask me all the time. I'm like, well, it's occupational, it's breath. Right? Anyway, so geographic originating site location, you had to be in a clinic uh, 
in a HRSA designated area, not a patient's home. Now this is CMS, this is Medicare. I know in Arizona, you could be anywhere as well as in California, anywhere. Um, in a, with a fox in a box in a tree. Uh, the patient can receive telehealth services anywhere right now, including the home. Uh, services eligible for telehealth, the list expanded dramatically. It's going to contract. we we'll take a look at that list in a second. Technology modality, again, interactive, audio, video, no telephone. Now we've got audio only. That is going to continue post-COVID for behavioral health in patients' homes. Uh, established versus new. So certain could only be provided to established patients. Of course, you can establish a new patient for CMS beneficiary. That 99202 through 99205 is included on the telehealth list and is a permanent addition on that list or a permanent resident. Um, established new patients. Uh, there, there are, uh, you know, a couple of modalities that say, uh, you know, RPM is not, remote physiological monitoring is not telehealth, but they allowed you to, you as a provider, you as a health system, a clinic, a facility, to prescribe RPM to patients who were new to your clinic. And you did not have to be established if there was a medically necessary reason to do so. Stuff like that. It's gonna go back to established after the PHE. Payment parity. So this is another thing. Uh, the G0463 that we've all grown, grown over and grown to love is going to disappear. So there will no longer be payment parity, payment parity for facility rates. And presumably non-facilities will go back to getting paid at the facility rate, not able to collect the originating site fee as they do now. Or, um, but everyone still gets to collect a transmission fee if you're a Medi-Cal recipient. And I'm, I'm balking on remembering whether or not T1014 is reimbursable in Arizona. So what is, okay, here I go. What does facility versus parity mean? So the G0463, it's the fee that your ambulatory clinic folks that own the building, the medical center, they get to collect over $120 for the, for the facility accoutrement. So the room, the nurse, the MA, front desk, you're paying for, because we don't get global, we don't get global at facilities. We don't get global reimbursement like clinics do. So the clinic, a physician, a non-facility clinic will get a higher rate of reimbursement for an evaluation and management fee in one clump, one, one lump sum, whereas for a facility, you get the pro fee and the facility fee. So this professional fee for an evaluation and management visit will be a little less, a little less than what the non-facilities get, plus uh, over $100 for the facility, because it costs more to run these in a facility than in a position. Typically paired with these CVT codes, it is not going to be reimbursed after the PHE is over and not even during, this, during the 151 days afforded us by the CAA of 2022. We don't have to worry about that yet because the PHE was extended today, yesterday. Okay, Ge geographic and site limitations. Going, gone, gone, um, but not yet. So everyone loves to be stay at home. I, I'm i gonna go into work today. I would prefer to stay at home and work. <laughs> I just love staying at home. 
Um, so it's great to get health services in your home. You don't feel good. Why would I drag myself out anyway? So the geographic site limitations come back, the geographic area, and plus where you can get telehealth performed must be in a clinic, FQ, CAH, stuff like that. Congress needs to amend the statute for this to happen. So after the Consolidated Appropriations Act, 151 days is over, it all goes back to the originating site from the before times. Could happen. Okay. Patient limitations. Right, can't. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Um, all right. The statute in existence does not require that CMS impose an in-person requirement for telehealth services, which means you can see new patients. So I'm not quite, I understand what this first bullet is. It, this has to do more with um, commercial payers or maybe consults to specialties. Uh, providers' ability to maximize investments in telehealth. You want to always see new patients. I think this has more to do maybe with licensing. I'm going to have to, have to ask Marty about that. But what I did like about it is there's no requirement that a patient has to be seen in person before you can give them a telehealth encounter, except for when after the 151 days are over, after the PHE is over, mental health services furnished in patients' homes, there must be an in-person meeting within, within six months prior to your first telehealth service. And then after, after, the, after you've established care, then it goes up to 12 months. All right, I'm going to check the chat. Yep, yep. Facility fees. I have not heard of any legislation out there requesting the facility fees. In lieu of the financial loss, I would say, um, this is Veronica's question about whether or not G0463 is being pursued. You heard of any other institutions will manage to continue offering telehealth services in lieu of the financial loss. You know, uh, seeing patients, Medicare patients in their home will also go away. And if you look at the demographics of where the bulk of your patients are, there would uh, probably not be able to offer telehealth to those Medicare beneficiaries because it, again, will be statutorily excluded and um, they would pay cash to see you. Uh, let's see. Distance site provider for RHCs will stay during the 151 days. Yes, for sure. Um, after the 151 days, no. My eyes widened. I might have told a lie. I'm not sure. I'm checking on that though. I've got a RHC uh, webinar coming up soon. Okay. 1246 already. I love talking to you guys. Okay. RPM and RTM, OPPS discoveries. This was my own presentation. And I have to say, I learned an eye popping thing to myself for myself. So non-facility pro fees, let's see. Let's look at the addendum B. So you notice 99453, not applicable. Now, if you look at the, the MPFS uh, CPT phys physician CPT code lookup on the Medicare website, it'll say that you get paid $19 for 99453 in a facility. That's wrong. I keep on meaning to email somebody and say, you're wrong, please don't. Um, but in a non-facility, you get $19 and three cents. 
For 98454, you get $55. Ready for mind blown? Probably already know this. On OPPS, because you know, my co-presenter Jake said, well, if a profi, if if a non-facility gets $19, what do you get in a facility? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so I looked it up. And, you know, maybe I thought, well, maybe it's on OPPS, and it is, and you get paid $121. Weird. So reimbursement for the professional fee in a non-facility is $19.19. In the facility, well, that's wrong. Payment differential. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, no, that's right. You get $121. So the difference... Is $102 more. Now for the 99454, you don't get as much monthly. So it's it's more like your upfront costs are bigger on the one time only build code. You get $12 less per month on the monitoring. But that's not coming out of physician fees. There goes Mitch. It's not coming out of physician fees. It's the ambulatory or, or the, uh, the facility fee, which is covered by other things. You know, you're getting that $120 perhaps on the E&M visit the day before the monitoring CPT is submitted for billing. So just something to, to keep in mind, mind blown again. It was a great takeaway I shared with all my friends. So here's the same thing with remote therapeutic monitoring. Look at all these facility practice expense RVUs. Nothing. You get nothing. But, oh, so in a non-facility, you get 19 bucks. Similar. It's 1938 instead of 1903. 55 bucks for musculoskeletal and therapy, uh, musculoskeletal and respiratory. Again, 121 bucks versus 19. And then you get $17 less per month. Maybe because you have more ancillary staff that can help monitor. Many hands make light work less money. So um, and the status indicator codes mean, so the V on this first code means it's a medical visit to the clinic or emergency department. And if you filter on that OPPS list that you can download as an Excel spreadsheet, there are other things on there that pay 121 bucks too, like a remote OCT, which is ophthalmic, something, you know, eyeball checker. That also pays $120. Um, so this STV, so the Q1 status indicator. So Q1 means it's paid when services are separately payable. If it's billed on the same data service as a V code, it's bundled things to think about. Do you drop the 99453 on the 16th day of data collected and the 99453 on the 17th day? Disingenuous, perhaps? Legal? Possibly? We'd have to check with compliance. I haven't thought it through yet. Interesting. Okay, MPFS considerations. I thought this was interesting. And this is uh, from our uh, friend at, um, a new friend at the AMA. Since 1992, this is the way physicians and other practitioners have been paid. It's updated annually, predetermined pre rate by CPT code based on that formula. And it applies to everything. That's all this. Calculated work RVU times the geographic 
practice expense times the geographic, PLI times the geographic equals total RVUs. Then you have your total times the conversion factor, which is 34 bucks right now. And then that, that gives you your, your money. So the interesting thing about that is the conversion factor goes down every year. On April 1st, it was decreased by 1% due to the sequestration, which is a federal reduction in payment. As of July 1st, it will go to that full 2% to pay providers less. That was decided upon prior to the PHE. The more, the more things that are added to the CPT book, the more things that get paid for in our budget neutral Medicare entitlement fund, the lower the conversion factor has to go to maintain budget neutrality. So this I lifted completely from May Kwong's <laughs> email that she sent out yesterday. Thank you, May, from the Center for Connected Health Policy. It's a great summary. I couldn't do better myself. She said, you're a doctorate. And she has staff that are super smart. Um, so anyway, this is, this tells you, I don't even have to talk about it. So what stays permanently after the PEG? Uh, geographic area, eligible originating site, mental health services, including mental, audio only. Uh, you got their six month and 12 month caveat. It's delayed past 151 days after the final day of any PHE extension perhaps July 15th, so 151 days following that, which is December something. Medicare reimbursement. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Medicare to FQs and rural health clinics won't be billed the same for mental health. It includes encounters furnished through interactive real-time telecom for mental health disorder. Doesn't answer that distant site versus originating site, does it? And also, I'm wondering if it addresses the PPS rate and the all-inclusive rate. Something to look into. So what stays on a temp basis? Patients at home, regardless of geographic area, expand my husband's coughing. Uh, he needs a telehealth visit. Reimbursement for the eligible providers. These guys are gonna go away. No. Uh, audio only tell for non-mental. No. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's gonna go away. RHCs as distant site telehealth providers for non-mental non-mental health services. For mental health services, you will get the PPS and all-inclusive rate. What goes away immediately? The codes on the telehealth list that say they go away at the end of the PHE. Controlled substances are going to, again, uh, be prescribed from physical location. So here we go. Uh, temporary addition for the PHE. So potentially, this initial observation care is going to go away now on July 15th instead of August 16th or August 7th, or what am I saying August? April 17th. These codes, category three, available through December 31st, 2023. We talked about that a couple of webinars ago. Um, so they're going to collect data on these other codes that are available for another year. What's up in the air? Enforcement on uh, the device. The policies are gonna go haywire. <laughs> I don't know. Again, CCHP has got a really great policy tracker. Keep us all up to date. Um, 
this is a great a great handout that describes how audio only works. I'll leave that to you to read later since we have three minutes left. Uh, impacts of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, or otherwise known as to me, the 151 days. So it does tell you which providers may continue and what happens um, if there's any difference at all. Great handout. So again, the PHE was renewed. It was published this morning. It was renewed yesterday. Um, if not renewed on July 15th, it's 151 days after July 15th, which takes us through December 15th or something. Here's where you can find that announcement. Do your own date calculations. I had trouble deciding if California was still on the same time zone as Arizona now that we're no longer on daylight savings. So dates, time zones, um, resources. Thank you to Jacob Harper, my uh, partner in crime at the AHLA uh, conference. We co-presented on RTM and RPM. Marty Arvin he used to be a compliance officer with the UCS or the UC Health System here in California. Cynthia Brown, my new friend at the AMA. Louise Joy, she was a joy to speak with, also a crafty person. We talked about knitting, jewelry, and crocheting. Jean Vance, she is in Sacramento, um, also a great person to know. And Mae Kwong, of course, who allowed me to steal all of her. No, I, I didn't even ask. I'm asking forgiveness after. And then also I wanted to give a special shout out to um, I'm blanking on her name because I, she was the one that gave everyone a heads up this morning that um, that the PHE had been extended. Nina Youngstrom, she's a reporter with uh, Compliance Cosmos, and she gave us all the heads up on the Rack Relief Listserv this morning. So special thanks to Nina. Just some snapshots of Baltimore. It was lovely. I know it's it's saddled with the high crime right now, but, um, you know, if, as long as there's a sugar plant and pretty lights, I'm happy. All right, so a few questions. Do we have any okay. questions? Uh, yes, we do. We still have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. I'm hoping you can stick around because it is, it, it's, it's one o'clock now. Can we, can we continue for a few minutes? Of course. Okay, great. Well, let me go back up to Lisa. Okay. who says, hello, Carol, could you please clarify for Medi-Cal if a physician provider can bill for telehealth services if they are in their home? And likewise, the patient is in a remote location, but not a medical facility. They may. For Medi-Cal, there is no specification as to where the provider must be located. Uh, the specification of using the G0463 is uh, the provider must be in the medical facility in order to bill that. Currently, um, for Medi-Cal, the provider can be at home and the patient can be anywhere as well. Please Perfect. don't be calling folks from Starbucks. You can be in your car, but please be parked. Right. A question or a comment from our friend Bill Pascal. According to everything I have heard, the new RTM codes for 2022 do not allow respiratory therapists to bill, even though the two use cases being called out are respiratory and musculoskeletal. Well, that's the crazy thing because there's a specific respiratory or pulmonary function, um, pulmonary function, therapeutic monitoring specific code. So that would have to be billed by an MD an NP, a PT, OT, or speech language pathologist currently. It's weird. Thank you. Arizona Medicaid, what's a Zoom meeting if someone doesn't forget to unmute, right? It's just not as much fun. Arizona Medicaid does not cover T1014 telehealth transmission per minute professional service. 
So Arizona does not access, no. doesn't? That's according to Rhonda Ellison. Okay. Those 26 Amanda. cents a minute kind of add up. Yeah, so. wish I got paid by the minute. I know. From Amanda, any idea if the distance site provider for RHCs will stay? Um, so reference that in one of the last slides that after the 151 days, it will not, unfortunately. Okay. Is there any legislation out there requesting continued reimbursement for facility fees post pandemic? If not, have you heard how other institutions will manage to continue offering telehealth services in lieu of the financial loss? Um, I addressed it briefly during uh, that, that part of the, the slide deck. Um, you know, other than being payer specific about who you are offering telehealth services to, um, for Medicare beneficiaries, it will be statutorily excluded again uh, come mid-December of 2022 if the PHE does not get extended through October uh, in July. So there's going to have to be some business determinations and, you know, you can't even give the patient an ABN because it is a statutorily <laughs> excluded service. Uh, I don't know. I, unless you have like a complete virtual clinic that you're setting up in one location that'll provide services um, like extra, which is what we don't want to do really because it, it's not supposed to be additive. Telehealth is supposed to be substitutive. But if you have a virtual clinic, and still have maintain all your in-person access, that would probably be the way to go. Ava mentioned that it would be great to see information on asynchronous reimbursement updates, such as Storm Forward. Cool. Let's do it. That would be a great theme, wouldn't it? Yeah. Just to separate that out, that's a good one-hour webinar right there. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. So today's archive and Carol's PDF handout will be on our webinar um, archive website and I put the link in chat and I'd like to thank Chris Martin very much for all of the technical support he gives us and he will be posting this video and the PDF there. Um, another question, are these federal regulations or the state of Arizona with regards to billing? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, the, the Arizona has very liberal telehealth policies. So any specific questions to that, go ahead and submit them to uh, Chris or Janet, and I will answer them for you. I think that's, yeah, I think that's it. What do you say, Janet? I love this. Is there still a possibility that legislation will be acted on that would allow services such as OT, PT, and ST to continue to offer telemedicine post the public health and emergency? Or is this a done deal? Is it done when it's done? I think that would have to be a statutory change as well, similar to originating site and geographic location. I'm sure there is legislation. Um, that's another thing. If you look, if you go onto the Center for Connected Health Policy site, they do track federal and states legislation with regard to um, numerous things. So um, if you can't find it there, definitely reach out and we can, we can do a search for you. And it is very interesting and challenging, and this is why you are so good at the voodoo that you do, is, you know, how can you stay on top of 50 different states legislatively? It is all different. That's why we have our trusty friends at the Center for Connected Health Policy, and you have your very own Arizona telemedicine program. Um, mm -hmm. If you practice in multi-states, though, it is helpful to not only refer to your Southwest TRC mm -hmm. telehealth program, but there's an upper Midwest one. 
there's a Southeastern TRC, there is an Atlantic, I guess it's called Eastern Atlantic or CTRC, Southeast, Northeast, mm -hmm. any TRC. So any of those uh, folks can help you track things down as well. And that's great for you to mention that because there is a, a TRC in your neck of the woods, no matter where you live. And those are the folks who have a lot of experience and are a great resource. And then certainly the Center for Connected Health Policy that they do the full-time job of looking at these things that change every day um, in every state. And so they are a fantastic resource. Well, Carol, thank you so much. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. Please thank both Mitch and Stan for their endorsement and support. And um, we really do love having the time to visit with you and appreciate your expertise. It's absolutely priceless. Thank you. And I so appreciate your spending time with me today. Everyone have a great day. Thanks, everybody.